It's Ramsey Dewey over here in Shanghai, China. Welcome to another edition of Q&A with the coach. Man, this is actually the third time that I have attempted to record this video because the first time I didn't have my microphone plugged in, the second time I didn't have it turned on, and both times there were mosquitoes flying around attacking me because it is mosquito season here in Shanghai. And there were some cruelty to animals on screen. Some mosquitoes died. And if you're not familiar with the YouTube community guidelines, cruelty to animals is not permitted to be shown on YouTube. So I had to edit that out. But I see a couple of them flying around in the background here. So we might have to make an exception for that, guys. Man, I had a hard time sleeping last night because I was about to drift off to dreamland, to that sweet point of slumber where you're just like, ah, but then... <laughs> Suddenly I'm covered in mosquito bites. I'm itching everywhere. Oh man, it was hard to get back to sleep. Why do we have mosquitoes? Did you know? All of you aficionados of chocolate, all you people who love to eat chocolate and chocolate related items, if it were not for the biting midge, a subspecies of mosquito like insect, it's not a mosquito proper, per se, but it is in the mosquito family. The biting midge. And just like their mosquito relatives, they bite. That is the animal that fertilizes the cacao plant from which chocolate is made. So, in short, no mosquitoes? You don't get your chocolate treats, friends. <laughs> anyway, God's creatures have their uses, even when they're awful. Our friend A.T. says, Hey, Coach, in traditional martial arts, if black belt techniques represent the pinnacle of what an art teaches, what would happen if a student was taught only those upper-level techniques from day one? Wouldn't someone studying only the black belt techniques for ten years actually be better skilled with those techniques than someone who spent the same ten years progressing through multiple ranks? and only encountering the black belt material during the last few of those years. That question reminds me of that movie, that Steve Odenkirk movie, what was it called? It was a kung fu movie parody. Enter the Fist. No. I don't remember. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but there's a character in this movie. A clown put in there for comedic value, and Kung Pao, Enter the Fist, that's the movie. Yeah. I don't remember the character's name, but he's funny because his kung fu master teaches him wrong on purpose as a joke. And so this guy is out there like, I will show you my face to your fist technique. Ha! Ah, my face has successfully smashed your fist. Ha 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 ha. And yeah, everybody's laughing in the background like, look at him. Look at that idiot. So why do I think about that? Because there's no such thing as a black belt technique. There are fighting techniques, there are techniques that are high percentage, there are techniques that are low percentage, there are techniques that are medium percentage, or whatever percentage of percentage that you want to ascribe to them. But there are no black belt techniques. So if you are spending the first 10 years in a, in a dojo learning a bunch of crap that isn't any good, it's not a good dojo. Get out of there, go somewhere else where they teach you the, the good stuff from day one. Let's look at a couple of martial arts. Judo, for example. The Uchimata. Uchimata is a judo throw that is taught to white belts. And it is used by black belts. If you want to be good at Uchimata by black belt level, you've got to start at white belt level. It's one of the fundamental throws. There are only so many judo techniques. As far as I'm aware, there's no secret black belt syllabus of judo that is only taught to you once, once you reach black belt level. You're honing your craft to get better from day one. Think about karate. Hey! What's that? It's a punch. There's a lot more to karate than punching, but that movement, that punch exists in every karate style. It exists in Taekwondo, it exists in Tung Soo Do, and many other martial arts, which are derived from karate. This is taught to a day one white belt. This is practiced 
by every black belt. Why? Because it's one of the most fundamental movements of karate, the punch. There's no black belt technique for a punch, which is separate and different from white belt level technique. That, that came out wrong. If you look at the way a white belt punches and the way a good black belt punches, yes, there will be differences gained from experience. But assuming that both men or women or children had a competent instructor teaching them the correct technique, there was no difference in what they were taught. They were taught a punch. And the guy who practices that punch thousands of times over many years gets better at it. That's what a black belt level punch is, if you will. Think about Taekwondo. Taekwondo has how many basic kicks? We've got the round kick, the front kick, the hook kick, the spinning hook kick, the round kick, the axe kick, the arc kick or crescent kick inside and outside. You know, we, we have a few basic kicks. And then some people assume if you, have, if you add a jump and a spin or a level change or a leap to one of these kicks, suddenly it becomes a black belt level technique. And no, it doesn't. What is the difference between a round kick and a tornado kick? Well, a round kick and a tornado kick are, well, they're both round kicks. The difference is a tornado kick, there's a jump, there's an air moment, there's a spin. But it's a round kick. And if you don't understand the basic round kick, you will never, ever, even perform a tornado kick, let alone a good one. What are white belts taught? They're taught first to do the basic round kick in Taekwondo. And when they can do a decent round kick, then you can add a jump and a spin. Is that a black belt level technique? No, white belts are taught the tornado kick too. White belts are taught all of the basic kicks. So what's different about the way black belts are taught? Well, it depends on your school, depends on your gym, depends on your dojo or dojong or kun or whatever you call your school. So everybody's different. There's not as much standardization in martial arts as people seem to think there is. Even in traditional martial arts, from one karate school to another, you're going to have a radically different experience. And so, to coattail on a unrelated question, I'm always asked almost every day, somebody's like, Ramsey, what's the best martial art to practice? What style should I do? <sighs> Look, you could visit a hundred different Taekwondo gyms and you would have a hundred different experiences. You could go to a hundred different Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu gyms and some of those would give you optimal experiences, some of them would give you crap experiences, some of them would be me. It's highly variable. What's going to make the big difference, the instructor, your teammates, the gym itself? They're not all created equal. And also your attitude that you bring into there. You can go to a crappy gym. Man, I remember hearing one of Dean Lister's students talk about uh, his, his early days teaching, and he was, I don't know, it was like some rec center or something like that. Not like a fancy proper gym, and the student would drive like 50 miles to go train with Dean Lister because he understood that this guy had knowledge. He was our you know, he was a leg lock specialist. This guy's like the best straight ankle lock dude. Man, shout out to Dean Lister, man. His instructional videos on the straight ankle lock were game-changing for me, man. That. So anyway, he would drive out to the like. This this crappy rec center or wherever Dean Lister was was teaching at the time, and train with the dude because he, he recognized real recognizes real, man. But the straight ankle lock. Let's talk about that for a minute. In jujitsu, the straight ankle lock is the only leg lock, under IBJJF rules, which is legal in the white belt division. And it's legal all the way up through the black belt division. A lot of white belts don't know this. <sighs> they think if somebody's playing with their feet, they're like, ah, oh, that's illegal, you can't touch my legs. Not true. There are actually a number of IBJJF legal leg locks in the International Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Federation. There are a lot that are banned. 
But the straight ankle lock, yeah, you learn that, you should learn that from day one. If, you, if you're a white belt and you don't know the straight ankle lock, how to do it, how to defend against it, several efficient ways to set it up, several efficient ways to avoid it, then you're not a good white belt. It sounds like an oxymoron, right? A bad white belt, but yeah, you you should learn that stuff. And if you're not being taught that, your instructors are doing you a disservice. It's not that the straight ankle lock is a white belt technique, even though it's allowed at the white belt level in competition. It's It's one of those moves that takes a long time to get really good at. You've got to develop certain attributes. You've got to develop your grip. You've got to develop your dexterity of getting your, your hands and arms and body and hips in to position the right way. This takes some time. So if you start at the white belt level, by the time you get to the black belt level, you will have leveled up your straight ankle locks quite a bit to the point where you can just snap shins in half. But most white belts, they're taught that technique and they struggle with it and they lack the physical attributes and the understanding and the kinesthetic bodily intelligence and they can't see the end from the beginning and they fumble around with it and they struggle with it and it's it's tough. And so not, not a lot of white belts tap people out with a straight ankle lock. But the good black belts will. But they've learned the same technique. It's just you you get better at what you do. Somebody in the comments right now is quoting Bruce Lee saying, I fear not the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks. I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. That's a weird quote because I understand the spirit of the quote, but 10,000 times practicing a kick really isn't that much. That's, that's like 10 days of training in, in a morning session in uh, you know a basic Muay Thai camp or Sunda camp. You'll throw 1,000 kicks in the morning session for sure. So it's not that many kicks, to be honest, but uh, I, I understand the spirit of it. So if you type that in the comments, that's okay. That's okay. I don't, I don't hate that quote. Well, let, let's read another part of this. Wouldn't somebody studying only the black belt techniques for 10 years actually be better skilled than those techniques? Look, are we talking about forms? You might be. A lot of martial arts teach different forms to different belt levels. And they're not technically black belt forms or white belt forms, but they're associated with the belt ranks. Take Taekwondo, for example. There are forms that are taught to the black belts. That are, there are forms that are taught to the white belts and the col colored belts that you're expected to know by a certain rank. When I was pretty early on, in my learning of, of Taekwondo, I th oh, what was my belt rank? Like green or blue belt, something like that. Pretty low rank. I had this idea, I'm going to memorize all of the black belt forms. And then that's going to put me on the trail to excellence really quick. And so I memorize all the forms, all the black belt forms, all the color belt forms, all of them. Every last one, every detail. And I'm thinking, yeah, this is going to up my Taekwondo game so much. And then... Sparring time came about and no difference. <laughs> and because you don't use any of those movements from the Taekwondo forms in actual Taekwondo competition. Funny how that works, right? And it wasn't until like 20 years later where I actually learned some of the applications of those forms. Mostly through trial and error. But look... Most traditional martial arts schools teach the forms, but not the function of the forms. And that's a huge disservice. It, it gives us this idea that, oh, these, these forms will make you better simply by knowing the dance. And that's... it's not true. It's not. If I teach you a movement, but not the application of the movement, it doesn't work. It's non-functional. You have to understand the reason behind it. So, learning the black belt forms as a colored belt, did it make me a black belt? Nah, no. I mean, it made it easier to get the black belt because I already knew the forms, but eh, 
did it make me so much better at Taekwondo learning those forms early on? Nah, not really. I have a book, one of my favorite books in my collection. It's out of print, so it's become a collector's item. Advanced Jiu-Jitsu by Marcelo Garcia. And I was so excited when this book first came out. I didn't have a chance to look through it first. I ordered it online. I got it for the retail price, fortunately, because it's listed as a collector's item. Like 500 bucks to get yourself a used copy now. But it's a great book. But when I first opened it up, I'm expecting Marcelo Garcia to explain all of his secrets, all the fancy, flippy, dippy jiu-jitsu there is. And no, instead it's 300 pages about how to take the back. Get to back mount, you know, one of the most basic, fundamental positions in jiu-jitsu. And how to finish the rear naked choke, you know, the most basic submission. The first submission everybody learns in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Why is it the first submission that everybody learns? I'll tell you. Because it's the most effective. It's the easiest to apply and it's the highest percentage attack in jiu-jitsu. It's the highest percentage submission in mixed martial arts and volley tudo fights as well. Wouldn't it make sense then to put all your skill points into the high percentage thing? Remember, there are high percentage techniques, there are low percentage techniques. And if you're being taught a bunch of low percentage crap as a white belt instead of high percentage stuff, you're not at a good school. So, I open up this book and it's 300 pages, how to take the back, how to finish the rear naked choke, and at first I'm a little disappointed because it's not a bunch of fancy flippy dippy stuff. It's not new positions. It's the same old, same old, but done better. And then I realized, ah, this is actually brilliant. This is how to take anyone's back. How to take a black belt's back. How to finish the rear naked choke against somebody who's good at jujitsu, Who is intelligently defending themselves. At a high level. How to beat that guy. That's advanced jujitsu. It's the same technique. But done better. Why? Because you you were learning through the eyes of experience. So I'm going to amend your question. Wouldn't it be better to learn martial arts from a more experienced instructor? Yes. Wouldn't it be better to learn martial arts from an instructor who is better at the art of pedagogy? That's teaching. Yes. Wouldn't it be better to learn the forms from somebody who knows how to apply those forms? Yes. And wouldn't it be better to learn all that stuff when you start out, as opposed to 40 years later when your body's breaking down? Yeah, it would. Wouldn't it be great if there were more traditional martial arts schools like that that just cut out all the crap? Yes, it would. Thank you for watching. Now get out there and train. Didn't get him, so doesn't count.